Hello, Sublation Media viewers, listeners, and future readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane, and this week I'll be reading an essay from Clint Montgomery. Specifically, I'll be reading his essay, Are Children Public Property? We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. In this plug, Harris Perry says a lot, and leaves a lot unsaid. On the surface, she's arguing for increased public funding for public education to take the burden off parents. But by calling children public property, she's not saying that children belong to society. The argument is that they, or at least their education, belongs to the state. This substitution of the state for society defines progressive liberalism, where the state comes in ostensibly to resolve problems in society that society cannot fix itself, and ends up fetishizing the state as an end in itself and at the expense of social potential. Remember, Marx does not say that the aim of communism is to abolish the family. He points out that capitalism is already abolishing the family by bringing women and children into industrial labor and by reducing intimacy and familial relations to an economy of time. To abolish the family by declaring the family public property, says Marx, would just amount to the general prostitution of women by the state. To think like Marx, we have to see what capitalism is already doing and ask whether this will be done consciously in a way that pushes and overcomes the contradiction or reacted to blindly and unconsciously. The MSNBC argument, of course, provokes a reaction by conservative liberals of the American First Movement. All of the next gen of the Democrat Party, if you go on any of these prediction markets, they'll tell you who's most likely to win the Democrat nomination for president in 2024, 2028. Think about all those people. The names are obvious. They're well-known people. Kamala Harris, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who's now the Secretary of Transportation, Cory Booker, AOC. Think all these people. They're different. They come from different walks of life, different parts of the country. What is the one thing that unites every single one of them? Not a single one of them has any children. And why is that? Why have we let the Democrat Party become controlled by people who don't have children? And why is this just a normal fact of American life, that the leaders of our country should be people who don't have a personal and direct stake in it via their own offspring, via their own children and grandchildren? How does society measure its investment in the next generation? Not by childless bureaucrats controlling the public purse, says Vance, but by families. And yet, under the degradations and endemic unemployment of neoliberal capital, family were not able to halt the slide into narcotics in the inner cities and former coal mine community. In this culture war wedge issue, the responsibility for raising the next generation appears split between the right of the state and the right of the family. In this video essay, we will pinpoint the void in between them, the division of labor or society. We will see where the split between progressive liberalism and conservative liberalism comes from and why Marxism cannot be reduced to either. However, since most self-avowed Marxists today are just progressive liberals, we'll see what the leader of the Socialist Party of America, Eugene Debs, and what the later critical theorist Max Horkheimer had to say about their fetishization of the state as the be-all, end-all for society. And to do this, we'll take a deep dive into the bourgeois aspirations for democratic education, the highest revolutionary self-consciousness of the Enlightenment, and how these aspirations got contradicted by capitalism, making Marxism necessary. This essay has been sourced by a member of our editorial team, so let us know what you think in the comments and hit that subscribe button. To flush this out, there are two big picture points to bring into view. The first is historical. We cannot flatten the historical difference between the radical bourgeois enlightenment, the self-consciousness of the bourgeois revolution, and the crisis of the latter in capitalism. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Rush called for universal public education, 
They had three assumptions that are not shared by the progressive liberal mass democratic welfare state of today. First, they assumed that more humanity meant more social potential. More babies was unqualifiedly good because it meant more potential Einsteins. Second, they assumed that the division of labor, society which objectified the right of labor in a growing and dynamic way, would work out all the problems that it itself posed. And third, the self-developing division of labor, the free association of people in civil society, meant that the only justification of the state was the degree to which it receded into the background of society and minimally enabled the self-developing dynamism of labor and competitive cooperation. This vision is a far cry from the mass democratic bureaucratic welfare state that manages overpopulation not as a potential subject but as mere objects of state control within an alienated industrial dynamic. This gets at the key historical differences between Jefferson's proposed system of universal education and the crisis of society as it is taken up by the capitalist state, managing daycares just as much as prisons. For Jefferson, society would provide education to all members in order to enable the historical right of generations to found the world anew. By ensuring the fruits of civilization and the education of the next generation, that generation would take up the division of labor and refashion it according to the new revolutionary needs of social freedom. I am increasingly persuaded that the earth belongs exclusively to the living and that one generation has no more right to bind another to its laws and judgments than one independent nation has the right to command another. In other words, universal public education for Jefferson was to enable the historical right of society to objectively transform itself by means of generations. This vision was giving voice to the radical critique that Enlightenment revolutionary thinker J.J. Rousseau thought that childhood itself leveled against the oppressive structures of prevailing civilization. Quote, Nature wants children to be children before they are men. Childhood has ways of seeing, thinking, and feeling peculiar to itself. Nothing can be more foolish than to substitute our ways for them. Children are the infinite potential of society. Each new generation, by taking up the division of labor, radically critiques it. Of course, this means that the socialization of children is also their stultification. Children simply inherit the pathologies of society and reproduce them. But childhood itself is potentially the critique of that reproduction. The idealism of youth can be set to any sort of emancipatory or reactionary project. Rousseau's critique is neither positive nor negative. It is beyond good and evil. Each new generation, simply by being born, can potentially throw all of society into critical relief. As industrialization swept the world and began to throw this radical enlightenment vision into question, the utopian socialists took it up in their proposals and in the communes they founded in the young North American Republic. Central to their imagination was overcoming the division between work and play. By rationally and efficiently organizing the factory and the field, labor time could be reduced for everybody, allowing for work to become play, deeply satisfying activity, both physically and mentally. While Fourier was conceiving the utopic social potential of industry, educational reformers added recess and play to the school schedule. Learning the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic did not yet seem to stand in any sort of direct contradiction with intuition, arts, and playfulness. Nevertheless, this utopian vision of converting the degradation of, of industrial labor into the ascetic openness of play came about only because an actual historical contradiction between the two was being opened up by industrialization itself. Jefferson's final letters expressed his optimism for the utopian labor communes and the model of a Fourierian phalanx was set up in the White House in the 1820s. Alas, it was not utopian socialism but Marx's political socialism that grasped the industrial twist in the dialectic of bourgeois labor cooperation, industrialization would have to be worked out 
and worked through historically and politically through the activity of the working class itself, taking up its own demands for the value of their labor and thereby pushing beyond it. This necessity for political or proletarian socialism came into full view with the U.S. Civil War. In the same year, slavery was abolished in the United States and serfdom in the Tsarist Empire, and Marx declares in his letter to Lincoln the anti-slavery war as a trumpet inaugurating the era of proletarian politics, the ascendancy of the working class as a historical subject prosecuting the industrial self-contradiction of the bourgeois division of labor. The working class would have to work through capitalism, and Marx criticized not so much the utopian socialists themselves, but their epigons who were attempting to fashion new utopic schemes of labor organization in the era of civil revolutionary war 30 years later, actually fell far below the critical horizon of Foyer and Jefferson. This brings us to the second big picture point, the political difference between proletarian socialism or Marxism and progressive liberalism. The wake of the Civil War saw the emergence of the Gilded Age and full-scale class conflict, and it is from the problems of this period that the assumptions behind the right of the state versus the right of the family flow into the 20th century in a disintegrative way. Because it is in this period that the nuclear family becomes obviously proletarianized and where the proposition of the state coming in to substitute its dissolution comes about. This latter proposition came from the middle-class progressivism, which attempted to address Gilded Age capitalism with an active, creative, democratic state. Its leading thinker and spokesman, especially in the domain of education, was John Dewey. Gilded Age industrialization precipitated a split in liberalism in response to the rising socialist workers' movement between conservative liberalism and progressive liberalism. Both were vying for the disintegrating middle class. Conservative liberalism promised the middle class it would benefit from big capital. Progressive liberalism, which emerged from within the Republican Party, sought to actively use the state to ensure this. Neither, of course, could make good on their promises, since proletarianization contradicted the bourgeois revolution whole scale. Nothing could prevent the middle class from falling into the ranks of the proletariat under new waves of capital accumulation. The void of society, called proletarianization, was being made conscious only by its object, the working class, becoming its subject. It was the Socialist Party of America that facilitated the working class becoming a political subject, against both progressive and conservative liberalism. Rather than being led by the middle class, the working class would have to subordinate the new urban professional associations to its own historical aim of realizing bourgeois labor by overcoming it politically. As Eugene Debs put it, if they were alive today, Jefferson and Lincoln would be not in the Republican or Democratic Party, but in the Socialist Party. The philosophy of capitalist progressivism was pragmatism, and its guiding thinker was John Dewey. Pragmatism reacted against the dog-eat-dog social evolution theory of conservative liberalism by attempting to introduce spontaneity, risk and choice into state action, or what we now call public policy. Truth would now be measured only by its results, allowing policy experimentation to deal with the burgeoning slums, crime, and immiseration. More importantly, however, Dewey as a progressive liberal found the bourgeois democratic revolution to have ended with the Civil War. American was now done with revolutions, and progress could take place within democratic experimentation by the state. He rejected that, in principle, a third American revolution was needed, the proletarian socialist revolution. For this reason, Dewey attempted to update the democratic ideals of bourgeois education to an urbanizing industrial age. Gone were the days of small-town rural life where the child gained self-reliance by taking part in the maintenance of house and farm from an early age. In the urban and suburban life of the child of today, he wrote, this is simply memory. The invention of machinery, the institution of the factory system, the division of labor have changed the home from a workshop into a simple dwelling place. The crowding into cities and the increase of servants have deprived the child of an opportunity to take part in those occupations which still remain, 
just at the time when a child is subjected to a great increase in stimulus and pressure from his environment, he loses the practical and motor training necessary to balance his intellectual development. Facility in acquiring information is gained. The power of using it is lost. While need of the more formal intellectual training in school has decreased, there arises an urgent demand for the introduction of methods of manual and industrial discipline, which shall give the child what he formerly obtained in his home and social life. In other words, children were becoming industrial workers, and the family a mere locus of consumption, a haven, and often a hell, in a heartless world. It was into this gap that public education could intervene. Dewey wanted both the natural spontaneity of childhood and the, quote, fixed methods of social discipline and influence of authority, end quote, to be serviced by the public school. Children were to get what was essential for their balanced development as democratic citizens from the public school. Learning would be hands-on and motivated by interests, not mere rote memorization, but participation in meaningful projects and direct personal experience. For Dewey, the classrooms would become the republic in miniature where group activity under self-direction and self-government would radiate progressive influences outward to stimulate and fortify the building of a democratic order of free and equal citizens. In short, public education would become the vanguard of democracy. Dewey himself was an earnest and honest liberal. In the 1920s, many Marxists came from progressive education circles in New York. His theories were applied via Lunacharsky in the Soviet Union, as well as in Turkey, Japan, China, and Latin America. And he defended Leon Trotsky, with whom he fundamentally disagreed politically, against Stalin's show trial slander. Nevertheless, Dewey never came to terms with the reality that it is the disintegration of the surrounding society which radiates in on the schools. For Marx, it was a proletariat which had to become the vanguard of democracy because it embodied the crisis and disintegration of society. It alone could lead beyond it by overcoming itself as a proletariat. By conserving the right of labor in a self-contradictory form, split between its degradation and its potential, the proletariat asserted the right of society objectively to transform itself. This could happen, however, only if it took charge of its own crisis politically via its instrument, the party, pressing the social right of labor toward socialism. What happens instead when progressive liberalism attempts to lead the proletarianization of society by disciplining the workers and curtailing the capitalists is that the right of labor becomes supplanted by the state. The state, or public policy, substitutes itself for society. This is a blind end to which conservative liberalism can only blindly react. Max Horkheimer will call the creative state of progressive pragmatism the, quote, subjective concept of reason. Denied is the truth of class struggle, because this truth is not positive or verifiable, but abysmal and dialectical. Where Dewey thought he was enabling the subjective spontaneity of children, the natural right of the next generation to flourish for themselves, by reducing reason to an instrument of the state, he was in fact naturalizing the society that stultified children. By defining truth only as a verifiable satisfaction of the subject, he was in fact reducing the highest aspirations of mankind to the fulfillment of desires of people as they are and not what they could be. The subjective concept of reason, where truth is defined by experimental satisfaction carried out by state policy with reason reduced to its instrument, was, for Horkheimer, the anti-philosophical spirit that led to the totalitarian persecution of intellectuals. Dewey as a person, of course, would be horrified to learn that his progressive state pragmatism was at the base of the Stalinist show trials, and yet this abasement of reason to mere instrument was the only result of subordinating the proletarian struggle for socialism to liberal progressivism. Stalinism and liberal progressivism were, in fact, allies against the monsters they unleashed by suppressing socialism. Politically and historically, they were the same. It is in the context of this dead-end alliance between progressive liberalism and Stalinism 
that debates over public education in the 20th century get hashed out. The debate becomes a public policy debate between standards and conditions. Both ignore the question of society because both conservative and progressive liberalism reject the necessity of a third American revolution. This debate and the void it avoids at the center can be seen both in the 1960s crisis of the New Deal progressive welfare state and in the neoliberal austerity that followed. After the 1965 Watts riots in L.A., Patrick Moynihan, the Secretary of Labor under LBJ's welfare status Great Society, proposed two solutions to the underlying social unrest. First, subjective attitude training, so that young people would be taught in welfare offices how to have the right aims and incentives. And second, objectively, 50,000 magical new jobs so that young people would have the real conditions to strive for. Twenty years later, as the collapse of the progressive welfare state gave way to neoliberal austerity, a report under Reagan pointing to declining SAT scores and slackening proficiency in math and reading to declare a nation at risk. The term slipped, even as the problem stayed the same. We need objective standards to incentivize schools and students, so school funding should be tied to school scores, incentivizing success, not subsidizing failure. Against objective standards, the left cried subjective conditions give schools more funding and students and teachers will do better. So whether the incentives of schools were to be geared through personal attitude training or standardized scores in math and reading, and whether the objective conditions were more jobs or more public school funding, the void in between them remained the same. The public policy state cannot just legislate individual personality nor magically create jobs and money. The pragmatic state of progressive liberalism with its subjective concept of reason, appears for Horkheimer like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where we come up with highly formalized tools like subjective attitude training or today's social-emotional learning for increasingly stupid ends, like getting jobs that don't exist. Quote, Aldous Huxley's negative utopia expresses this aspect of the formalization of reason, that is to say, its transformation into stupidity. In it, the techniques of the brave new world and the intellectual processes connected with them are represented as tremendously refined, but the aims they serve, the stupid feelies that allow one to feel a fur projected on screen, the hyponopedia that inculcates the all-powerful slogans of the system in sleeping children, that standardize and classify human beings even before they are born, all these reflect process taking place in thinking itself that leads to a system of prohibition of thinking and that must end finally in subjective stupidity prefigured in the objective idiocy of all life content. So to end, we'll sum up what's actually at state in the culture war split between the right of the state and the right of the family to educate the next generation. What's really at stake behind the blind reactions by both progressive and conservative liberalism is the historical right of the next generation to take up the division of labor and objectively transform society. For this, a Marxist left would assert not public education as a vanguard of democracy, but labor itself. Only a third American revolution, the proletarian socialist, could realize the aims of bourgeois education by overcoming capitalism. Until then, children will be just as stunted as the society they are born into. As a final image, the revolutionary Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant said that, quote, children ought to be educated, not for the present, but for a possibly improved condition of man in the future, that is, in a manner which is adapted to the idea of humanity and the whole destiny of man. But this was met with two difficulties. A, parents usually only care that their children make their way in the world, and b. Sovereigns look upon their subjects merely as tools for their own purposes. Today, this dichotomy appears as a degenerate culture war wedge issue between the family and the state. Can the left get past this by returning to the objective right of labor to transform society, to the revolution of Jefferson, Lincoln, and Debs? <laughs>